Okay, so this is a 63 years old male admitted after a minor uh, RTA, you know, with 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 plash neck injury, um, neck pain, C5 radicular pain, uh, has uh, past medical history severe aortic stenosis with a left carotid stenosis more than 70 percent. As far as neurology is concerned, the spastic tetraparesis with grade 3 uh, distal upper limbs, grade 4 minus lower limbs, sensory level C6, hyperreflexia, Babinski, and bladder dysfunction. So we have here a central cord uh, uh, injury, central medulla injury with a GOA of uh, 8. Uh, these are the X-rays, flexion, extension, neutral. So no fracture or major instability. You have a straight to lordotic C-spine. And we found uh, his previous scans in, in 2011, and this was the, the MRI. Uh, the doctor who saw the patient at the time said, he's symptomatic, wait and see, too risky to operate. So two years later, you know, on the day of, the, of this accident, we found those MRIs, you know, with a, with a predominant anterior three-level compression with rather straight spine. So my question to you is uh, what to do on this case. There are several ways to skin a cat. Um, so what would be your take? I have a comment on, on this case. It is not usual that you have a car accident and you have, after that, hyperreflexia immediately. So I presume that the patient has some pathology or some clinics prior to the accident, maybe. I mean, the patient was not doing well before the accident. Right. So this is and a typical his, case. The, the symptoms are not new symptoms. Right, right. I agree. I mean, that is to, to, uh, an interval of two years between the last assessment was basically was asymptomatic. And now this is the case of a minor injury on a previously myelopathic patient. Okay. Yeah. But what, we, have, we have to know what's new in here. In, in her pathology, what, what's new so in her what, symptoms? Right, so what I have is a history of two years before, it was asymptomatic, and uh, despite uh, some compression, uh, nothing was proposed. Um, and now this guy has a minor trauma and shows with, with a quite important neurology and, and with this uh, cord compression. So my question is, or should we operate immediately? Should we delay the surgery? Uh, should we go from the front? Should we go from the back? These are the discussions. So uh, it's interesting because uh, yesterday uh, our uh, webinar was about uh, spinal trauma, but Surgery. several of the, uh, the, the um, uh, participants were asking about this kind of situation. I mean, uh, a patient with uh, spondylectric myelopathy with a minor trauma and developing a, a, a symptomatic uh, spinal cord injury, uh, even with no instability, no fracture at all. So it's quite interesting to discuss this. Uh, may, may I ask you about a, a, a CT scan? Because uh, we can see there's some compression um, in, in not only uh, behind the disc, but uh, also behind the, 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 the vertebral body in C6. Do you have a CT scan? I don't have it here, but it was, it was clean. No calcification. Okay, okay. Asdrubo, you want to make a comment, please? Yes. Uh, yesterday, as, as you talk, we discussed this case, uh, this type of case. One thing that we, we should raise uh, a question is who will operate two years ago? A symptomatic patient with exactly. spinal canal stenosis, and and that that is one concern is when the patient cannot follow uh, all the 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 next consultation. Like we usually try to follow them every like each three months, and then to see if you we can. Uh, have an uh, early event as hyperreflexia or something like that. From now, I, I consider this case for uh, a surgical procedure. I, I usually do an anterior approach for this case. 
but but the question is uh, the procedure is uh, required immediately yes or yes. Do, you, do you give some kind of treatment and after that uh, you plan the, the the kind of operation i i usually do this early i i usually if the patient is clinically stable i do the surgery whenever i have all the instruments all the equipment I agree with Drubo, and uh, let us see what Michael ha has to say about this. Michael, do you have your presentation? Do you want to make a comment on the, the, the case or start with your presentation? Uh, please, you, you are our uh, main speaker tonight. Please, go ahead. He's worried with his, with his uh, slides. I, I mean, again, uh, 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 we have to know if, if of the car accident is, I mean, contributed in a way or another way for her symptoms. It seems not. It seems that there is a there is a myopathy, and no, 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 uh, Annie. You, you was the, the day of the accident when we woke up. He was fine. He was walking. No problems. Uh, so, so we have we, we have a, uh, 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 Are you sure that the symptoms are central core syndrome? I mean, this is related with the trauma, okay? Yeah, but, yeah, but, but, I, the, but the essential is to establish that this is a patient with uh, cervical spondylotic myopathy, myopathy. plus now uh, 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 core injury, right? So yes. uh, we yeah. have two, two, two situations, two different situations. Okay, so... Uh, so chronic so, spondylotic myopathy, and which trauma. now... Uh, is had uh, a minor, uh, trauma, a minor trauma. trauma. The, the consequences of the trauma. Yeah. Yeah. So, in the classification of the myelopathy, it's in moderate uh, degree. Okay, do you agree? It's a moderate. The problem is not yeah. critical. So, the question is, uh, Doctor Brock, I would like to to question you uh, about this. Is required an immediately uh, procedure? or is better uh, to wait? I think the patient had already symptoms because he had an MRI two years ago. So probably he had already symptoms and he had to be operated on on those days. But now he had an emergency case for us and we definitely go to surgery as soon as possible. This is a, I will do it an anterior, probably a corpectomy to Two vertebras, five and six, with a uh, Allen heart and in plate. But it, it should be as soon as possible to decompress the spinal cord to gain something for him, neurosurgical. Okay, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm absolutely agree with you in the sense of the the patient require immediately surgery, as as Robert say. But now the situation is. Uh, what is better, corpectomy or uh, multilevel disectomy? No, or I would you decide. Corpectomy, because he had a, an OPLLL, even if with a CT, it doesn't show that is uh, calcified. Probably in the MRI, we see the, the that is compression too by OPLL in C6. Probably. So I will do corpectomy two level and three disc, definitely. What Pablo levels Vela. do you, levels do you use? Uh -huh. What, what Pablo levels Pablo do you Vela, use? Any other consideration? Corpectomy for five and six. Any, would anybody consider a laminoplasty here? Mm -hmm. It's, uh, six, it's an option. Neck pain um, could be a possibility. Yes, of course. But with the he has a big disc on five six. Yeah, I'd be concerned about that big disc and maybe maybe want to do that through a corpectomy. But uh, I, I think with good lordosis, I don't know what the patient. I didn't hear what the patient's neck pain was, but I think I would at least consider a laminoplasty over multiple levels as an option, I think, here. I, I may agree with you thinking a corpectomy may be the better way to go, but uh, because I do think there is some thickening of the ligament behind the all of those vertebral right. bodies, um, but perhaps, you know, laminoplasty may be something I may consider as well. Yeah. 
Dr. Spat, Dr. Steinman, are you ready for a presentation? I am. I am. Yes. Okay. Should I, should I go ahead? And... If you are ready, you can answer this question for us now and during your presentation. Can we? Okay. Can we, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, can can just, start, uh, go ahead, finish. please. No. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. After the presentation, Oscar, you come back, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. so let's see if this works. So I'm just going to hit share. I'm going to hit share started. screen, and we'll see if this we'll see if this goes. Huh? So share screen. Please, uh, everybody, show this. turn off the camera and put the microphone my microphone on mute. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Okay, so let me see if this is going to work. Share screen. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Um, this yes. has been, uh, I, I apologize to everybody for the uh, time that that has taken. I, I could not open the presentation on my computer from work, and I had to try to transfer it to a, a third computer, which took some time, but I finally was able to open it and, and get going. So I'm, I'm very, very honored uh, to be part of this uh, webinar series uh, and with uh, friends, uh, old friends, new friends as part of this webinar series. And uh, the task that uh, I was given was to talk about uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy. That was a good case to kick off with the um, more of a traumatic case, uh, uh, but we can sort of talk through some of the natural history of this, not necessarily from an acute spinal cord injury, um, like an acute traumatic myelopathy, but more of the spondylotic degenerative myelopathy. Now, I, I noticed there were a um, number of, of people on this presentation, you know, over 800. And uh, so I, I kept this as a somewhat of a general uh, presentation. So for many of the uh, more experienced surgeons, doctors, some of this will be uh, a little basic in the beginning, uh, but we'll, th we'll then get into some of the newer uh, data that's out with regards to this. So I apologize for that, that those are that are well advanced, but those that are not, this will be a nice review of this uh, uh, of this very, very common disease. And so I want to talk with this hour, focus on, you know, really the presentation of cervical spondylotic myelopathy, um, some of the natural history, um, some of the data around recommendations for management, uh, the options we have for treatment, uh, and then look at some of the outcomes with regards to treatment, which I think is important when we talk about how to best manage these uh, problems. It's still not entirely clear. Yeah, and even that that's borne out in the data as we'll go through some of that. And so when we look at spondylotic myelopathy, we know that the incidence is increasing as our population continues to increase. It's more common in the later ages of life in the fifth and ninth decades. Uh, and the prevalence of this disease is, is, truly, uh, is truly not known uh, at this point. Uh, the causes are broad. We just saw a case of a uh, acute traumatic myelopathy, you know, the so-called central cord syndrome. Probably the most common cause is going to be spondylosis, you know, due to just degenerative disease, disc bulging, osteophyte buckling of the ligament and flavum, uh, as we see here uh, on, on this image. But we've got to remember that we can see it in a number of other cases as well, tumor, infections, trauma, as we just saw. So uh, degenerative nature being the most common, but other causes we have to keep in play uh, as well. Um, and I think we here in our center at uh, Cleveland Clinic, we get caught up on the MRI and try to lump everything together as cervical stenosis uh, and try to put a clinical condition into an MRI finding. Uh, and I think we've got to keep in mind that when we talk about myelopathy, it's not really just the MRI finding. It's, it's really that constellation of symptoms and signs due to that compression on the spinal cord, which resulting in the dysfunction as we see leading to that clinical condition of, of, of myelopathy. So it's not just the, it's not just the MRI finding, it's, it's what we're finding with those patients. I think for a little background for a lot of us, going back to maybe our early years in, in neurosurgical and spine training, as we all remember, uh, when we look at the conditions uh, of how these patients present, the most common complaint early on with patients with myelopathies with upper extremity sensory complaints, often numbness, tingling uh, in the hands, that's quickly followed by gait dysfunction, and a, you know, a taxic gait or a gait uh, with lack of balance. Wide-based gait is very common. Uh, and then loss of hand dexterity. I think the most common hallmark of this uh, is really just losing fine motor control uh, in the upper extremities being the most common with findings in the lower uh, extremities being less, less common. And 
the, the, the rationale behind this is, is not entirely clear, but it's probably due to, again, the lateral white matter tracts in the spinal cord being affected by compression and or ischemia and trauma, and those cortical spinal tracts being much, much more important for upper extremity fine motor control versus lower extremity gait function. That probably has more to do with the upper extremity findings versus the lower extremity findings. Now, there is a little bit of, uh, I guess, uh, debate around the natural history of this disorder, and this would be kind of interesting to find out from our panel of debaters when we're through with this, but how you talk to patients with regards to what is going to happen to one of these patients if they present very early on with, say, very mild myelopathy. I think many of us use the classic study from Clark and Robinson. This was published in the 1950s, where these authors showed that about almost 80% of these patients just have a very slow, steady decline in their condition over time. Only about 5% very rapidly decline, and 20% and have what I would call a stepwise decline, where they decline, they stabilize for a long period of time, they decline, they stabilize. But with the vast majority of people getting worse and getting worse over time, uh, Clark and Robinson showed that it was worse in elderly those that presented with a more severe deficit. And they showed that getting back to normal really doesn't happen. People don't get better. Uh, and again, I think we often use this data when we're trying to counsel patients with regards to recommending treatment. But not all the studies back in the 1950s and 50s and 60s showed similar data. Like Lees and Turner is, a, is another study. This is from 1963 that often people talk about. This was only on 44 patients. Uh, but what they found here is that Patients uh, not only stabilize, but they also could have resolution of their symptoms. Now, it's presumed that those patients actually had surgery, so there's some debate in this paper. But if you look at this paper as just a natural history paper, you, su you could suggest that people just remain stable and actually a lot get better uh, over, uh, over a period of time. Uh, Simon and, and Lavender, also in the 1960s, again, showed kind of what we saw uh, uh, with Clark and Robinson. Patients slowly got worse. Um, they did uh, not show stability, and it really worked against the prior uh, paper uh, and showed that people, you know, just tend to slowly get worse. And those that got better probably had a laminectomy. And again, Nurek's classic paper in 72 showing the same, um, uh, that patients get worse, they don't get better, uh, and you could even see improved prognosis and mild disease. So this kind of led the, the base of how we describe the natural history, very small groups of patients all retrospective, all very early, 1960s, 1970s, and this is based much of how we counsel patients with regards to what their natural history was and how we should operate on them. But since then, as we all are aware, and many on this, on this Zoom meeting have probably contributed to this literature, uh, we've seen a fairly significant expansion of what we know with regards to the prognosis and the natural history of patients with myelopathy now there's multiple papers that, have, that are out there and published looking at the natural history of this disease. I think a lot of the, the, the current literature has been summarized and even put out by AO Spine, um, looking at a number of the aspects of degenerative cervical myelopathy. Here's a paper, this was published in 2017, just, a, just a, you know, not long ago, looking at the natural history. This was a systematic review. And really what they found here is I think what we kind of already knew, which was, you know, over half of these patients are going to decline over the next three to six years, right? They're all going to probably decline at least one point in their JOA score over three to six years, which would sort of go back and support what we saw uh, early on, which is this slow, steady, steady decline. Uh, and that decline, though, can be pretty substantial. So if you look at one year, Patients may have about a 6% decrease in their uh, ADLs, their activity of uh, daily living from baseline. But if you look out to 10 years, it may be up to 56%. Again, so showing a pretty profound impact on the natural history uh, of this disease if we look at the literature. So we sort of have this, this balancing act, right? So we have some natural history that shows that these patients will worsen over time. We know that they're going to decline. But there are some patient factors that are going to mitigate that risk or even potentially increase that risk. Like, so what do we know in these patients that are going to say maybe these have a higher risk to progress neurologically versus these have a much lower risk to, to progress? And we can use that in deciding what the natural history is and, 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 and how we move forward. And 
again, this a lot of this comes out of the AO, but what's been found is patients that are older, patients that are female, those that have a more circumferential compression of the spinal cord as opposed to focal compression, those that have high initial disability, so perhaps high or low MJOA scores and longer duration of symptoms, we know those patients tend to have a much higher risk of progression versus the opposite, your younger patients, more male patients, uh, those that have a much higher transverse diameter of the cord, they have less initial disability, so a much higher MJOA score in a shorter duration of symptoms. So those are acting in, in uh, differentiation with themselves, and we can use that data, again, to help counsel patients with regards to the natural history and maybe when we should proceed with surgery. So this is just you know, some of that actual evidence. So looking at those demographics showing that older age and female gender tend to have a higher risk of progression. Uh, what's interesting is shorter height. So those of us on the Zoom call that aren't very tall, actually that's somewhat protective of progression of disease. Uh, how about radiographic findings? As I mentioned, circumferential cord compression, more associated with a decline where a larger transverse cord area uh, uh, was associated with some protection. What's interesting within in this study, there was no increased association of cord signal and neurological decline in mild patients. So again, another question I think would be interesting uh, to the panel is, do you treat patients differently if they have very mild symptoms and they have T2 cord signal and MRI versus not? And the data, at least out of this AO predictive modeling study, would suggest that that degree of cord signal really had minimal impact on if they were going to decline or not. Uh, clinically, again, we mentioned um, uh, those that have uh, more mild disease with less duration tend to have a less risk of declining. Uh, and there were more, uh, there was a more, a greater chance to have surgery in those patients that had greater cervical range of motion, focal kyphosis, or a presence of a slip. And I think that often gives us, us as surgeons, some idea perhaps, you know, maybe we should operate on them. So if we put patients on kind of this scale of progression or risk to progression from low to high, those that have lower chance to progress that maybe we can watch a little bit closer are going to be our younger patients that are tending to do better on presentation, more mild symptoms like higher MJOA scores. They have less dysfunction, shorter duration of symptoms versus those patients that are older, have you know lower JOA scores and more dysfunction. Perhaps those have much greater risk. Uh, and we can use some of this newer natural history data uh, and, and, and this predictive analytics to help us predict what patients perhaps we should take to surgery earlier and perhaps ones that maybe we could follow uh, for a longer period of time. So again, I think when we look at the natural history with everything that's out there, the clinical course is variable. However, uh, most studies predict patients will progress and not necessarily improve uh, over time. Uh, the natural history suggests that myelopathy is a surgical disorder, something that should be treated uh, from surgery, uh, and that once moderate signs and symptoms develop, prognosis is poor to continue to follow those patients non-operatively. Those are the ones we should probably move on. If we follow them from mild symptoms to moderate symptoms, you know, we should move on and actually give those patients surgery and, and get the spinal cord uh, decompressed. So again, you know, the causes of myelopathy from a spondylotic standpoint you know, the, run, the more common is going to be spondylosis, disc bulges, bony osteophytes, ligament and flavum buckling. Uh, we can see patients with compensatory subluxation throughout the cervical subaxial spine. Patients may have kyphosis uh, where the spinal cord can be draped over that kyphus uh, and result in perhaps ischemia. Uh, and we can see patients with OPLL, perhaps similar to what that trauma patient we saw that, that had perhaps some thickening and ossification of the ligament behind the vertebral bodies. We got to keep in mind too that there can be dynamic stenosis and we've seen that here at Cleveland Clinic on a few occasions where we have done an MRI of a patient who has symptoms of myelopathy and they've been, the MRI has not shown any compression of the spinal cord. We've, done, we've then done a flexion MRI or an extension MRI which we're doing more frequently nowadays and actually have seen dynamic compression and offered surgery based on that. So I think we've always got to keep in mind what can happen, what can happen from a dynamic standpoint uh, as a potential cause of, uh, of their symptoms. Uh, exam hallmarks, I think we all are aware of. Patients often have a wide base gait, so they're somewhat ataxic. You know, the hyperreflexia, three to four plus refluxes, 
looking for things such as Hoffman's findings, Babinski signs, clonus, all indicating um, a hyperreflexia or spinal cord release. Uh, they may have atrophy of the hands like we see here. Uh, and patients in severe cases may have a Lermite sign. Um, and there are clinical exam findings which can be done, you know, like the finger escape sign, things that can help uh, with some sensitivity and specificity uh, as these patients would have myelopathy if some of these findings were, were seen uh, on exam. So, so that sort of covers, I think, natural history uh, and how these patients present. But let's, I think, talk about what may be more interesting from a debate standpoint is, you know, how do we treat these patients? What are the options for them? Uh, and then what are some of the outcome data that helps support uh, that or, don't, or do not support that? So as I mentioned, indications for surgery have been uh, somewhat controversial for the patients with mild symptoms or asymptomatic, and I think a little less uh, controversial for those that have moderate to severe symptoms. But the AO, again, has done a nice job of, of looking at their prospective multicenter trial and try to answer some of these questions for us. Uh, and this was some of the data that came out of the clinical practice guideline uh, looking at the AO cervical myelopathy study. But again, I, I think what's important when we look at with this data is this is looking at patients with mild, moderate, and severe disease. So all, and patients without any symptoms. So they looked at all patients that were there. And so when we look at the data that's out there, this is looking again at patients with severe or moderate CSM. Uh, this are the patients that are obviously symptomatic and obviously have spinal stenosis. You know, should we operate on those patients? And I think we all agree, everybody on this Zoom meeting would agree that these are patients appropriate for surgery. Uh, the evidence is moderate and the strength of the recommendation is strong that these patients should undergo an operation to try to alleviate and at least stabilize their symptomatology. I think all of the, uh, all of the um, controversy has been around those patients that present with very mild symptoms. What do you do with that patient with an MJOA score of 14? and only some very mild tingling of their hands, but have cervical stenosis, when are they appropriate to undergo surgery? Should you even operate on them? Should you wait? Or should you operate on them early? Because remember, what we've talked, what we've taught our trainees over multiple years is that our surgery is done to stop the progression of the symptoms, not necessarily to improve patients. So the only reason then to operate with somebody with mild symptoms would be to actually give them some improvement. Uh, and, and what does the data really support there? Can these patients improve? Uh, here's another paper out of, the, out of the AO group looking specifically at patients with mild myelopathy. So the, these are the very high uh, MJOA scores. Uh, it was 193 patients. It's prospective. It's multicenter. Um, what's interesting here is just how do these patients look compared to more, quote, unquote, normal patients, patients without mild myelopathy? And you can see that these patients actually scored worse compared to population norms with regards to social functioning, physical functioning, and even mental health. So even the patients that we see that just have a little hand numbness and we think that's not that big of a deal, these patients actually score fairly poorly compared to normal population with regard to this normal quality of life and functional quality of life. And we look at how all of these patients do uh, from, uh, from their baseline out to two years, they all essentially improve. So this is looking at mild and moderate severe, which is important. So including those mild patients, um, that they do get better with the MJOA scores, their NURIC scores, their SF36 scores as well. And the rate of complications was low, which is important. So I think the only argument we could make to operate on mild patients would be that we could actually improve them uh, and that our complication rates were low. And this AO study, this multi-center study, uh, would support that, that these patients could actually get better, um, their quality of life improves, they make gains in functional status and disability and quality of life. So making an argument that we should consider surgery for even those patients with mild symptoms. And so they went out with their clinical practice guideline, though, uh, and said, okay, those patients with MJOA scores 15 to 17 mild symptoms, what should we do with them? Again, the evidence that's out there, the, everything that I mentioned is based on not very strong evidence, okay, so it's kind of a weak recommendation, but the re recommendation would be to either offer surgery, uh, and if you don't, to at least observe them closely, uh, and if they do show any neurological deterioration, then go ahead and move forward with surgery, 
knowing that those patients would probably actually improve uh, clinically. And that's sort of been my practice uh, in patients with mild myelopathy. I really sit down and talk with them uh, and offer them surgery, but also offer them a very close observation uh, and offer, you know, to follow them closely and only move forward if they deteriorate. So it seems like both of those options uh, are appropriate. Now, uh, again, an area that's very controversial, I think, is, is, or at least here in the United States, is what about the asymptomatic patient? So this is a patient that has no complaints, and a, and a very typical um, presentation here in my office would be somebody who has neck pain or headache uh, undergoes an MRI of the cervical spine uh, and has, is found to have severe spinal stenosis, um, but has no other neurological complaints. So they come into the office because, they're, because their primary medical doctor said, you need to go see a surgeon right away. This is an emergency. You need to have surgery. So, but when you talk to the patient, they have no symptoms, no neurological findings, uh, but they have spinal stenosis. What do we do with those patients? Um, there's been a number of surgeons uh, here in our city and around us that would actually uh, take these patients to surgery uh, and decompress their spinal cord. Uh, and, of, of course, we see patients that often can develop a complication from that. And you always have to wonder, should they ever have even undergone an operation at all uh, and perhaps just been followed? So there, has been pe there have been groups that have looked at that. This is a, a, a review of the literature. Uh, for asymptomatic spinal stenosis, they only found three relevant articles. So the evidence or the uh, literature that's out there out, out here is very poor. It's very sparse. So it's hard to make any recommendation, but there really is no evidence to support operating on these patients. But unfortunately, because the evidence is very poor, there's no evidence to suggest you shouldn't. So um, the, the, the data just does not exist to argue to do this. Uh, and these authors make a re recommendation, look at the patient's age, how active are they, could they injure themselves, talk to the patient specifically, make them part of the decision making uh, if you're going to decide, uh, uh, decide uh, for surgery. The AO took it one step further with regards to their clinical practice guideline and actually said, should we operate on these patients? And just showed that there's really no evidence at all out there to support that. And the recommendation is against offering surgery in an asymptomatic patient. So again, I think this will be an interesting conversation with our panel uh, around uh, their thoughts on patients that are asymptomatic in stenosis. Should we operate on these patients at all? The evidence, again, I think would suggest that we shouldn't uh, because they have very little chance that they're going to improve because they're already asymptomatic uh, and, and they face some uh, risk of surgery. So if we put this in an algorithm, then, uh, of an approach to these patients, um, we can look at it like this. So, one, do they have spinal cord compression on the MRI? Uh, yes or no. And are they myelopathic? Do they have those physical exam findings, as we mentioned? Do they have the actual symptoms of it, the numbness, the tingling, the, the fine motor dexterity changes, the, uh, the gait changes? Uh-oh. Can you guys still see my presentation? Something has changed on my screen. Yes. Um, okay, I'm sorry. A lot, it just changed. Here we go. I apologize for that. Um, I did. Um, okay, so if they're myelopathic, yes. Then we've got to see what their symptoms are. So if the symptoms are mild, then our option is either to offer surgery. The data would support surgery um, or at least close observation. Um, and if we're observing them, if they worsen, then that's the patient we're going to move forward to do surgery on. Um, if they're moderate or severe, then the, the recommendation is those we're going to move on for surgery. Uh, and if they're not myelopathic, just have cord compression, then really just observe those patients closely, follow them over time, uh, and only move forward uh, with surgery. So this is a very, I think, easy disease to put in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an algorithm approach uh, and decide how we uh, make an indication for surgery. But if we are going to go forward with surgery, really what are our goals? Uh, primarily the goal has been to relieve the compression on the spinal cord, no matter what we do surgically, anterior, posterior, anterior and posterior together, we have to relieve the compression on the spinal cord, okay? Uh, and that has to be done. Nowadays we think about deformity, 
Should we, should we correct deformity? Should we stabilize the spine so we prevent deformity? Again, this is, I, again, there's some uh, um, controversy here. Should we be doing very big deformity operations on patients with myelopathy? But we, I think we've got to consider that. And I think importantly today, and I'll show some data behind this, is we've got to maintain cervical balance. We need to maintain the cervical sagittal vert uh, vert vertical axis within about four centimeters uh, from C2 to C7. Uh, the data would suggest that those patients tend to do better uh, if we maintain that balance. And if we, if we cause the patient to be out of balance after surgery, they tend to have worse quality of life scores. So I, again, I think this is something um, that we've really got to pay attention to nowadays. And I'm sure everybody uh, on this meeting and our panel for sure uh, does focus on this uh, uh, in, the, in the current era. Now, again, none of this is novel. Uh, we know what the approaches are. We talked about some of this with the trauma uh, case that was presented. But in general, for patients with myelopathy, we have anterior and posterior approaches. Anteriorly, uh, we think about ACDF, anterior cervical discectomy infusion. We think about corpectomy. We think about even artificial disc replacement uh, uh, as options. We, and we think posteriorly about laminectomy alone, laminectomy infusion, and laminoplasty. So that's probably the armamentarium that we have, and even combinations of these, right? A corpectomy plus a discectomy infusion, et cetera. There's, there's things that we can combine uh, uh, in order to uh, 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 treat these patients. In general, we think about an anterior operation or a ventral operation where the, the ventral compression is the most significant, significant or if there is a, a deformity or a kyphosis deformity, which is perhaps uh, uh, allowing the spinal cord to be draped across the deformity, or if there's only one to three levels. So the fewer the levels, again, an anterior or ventral approach may be more appropriate. I think we, you know, you think a little bit less about the alignment of the spine. You could do ventral surgery anterior surgery if the patient is kyphotic, maybe ideally, but also if they're lordotic. Uh, so alignment is maybe a little less relevant here. But with posterior surgery, again, it tends to be more indicated for multiple levels. So those patients that have three or more levels, easier, safer, faster, perhaps to do that posteriorly or dorsally. Um, but I think, you know, we want to look at a patient that has a more neutral alignment of their spine or a more lordotic of their spine. Lordotic alignment may be much more appropriate posteriorly or if someone has a severe kyphosis, uh, a posterior approach is probably a little less appropriate operation. And, and why is that true? Like, why does that matter? Well, all of it has to do with the ability to have the spinal cord drift away from the compression. And I think we this was brought up on that case that was shown first with that big ventral disc. So the only way any operation would work, I had mentioned a laminoplasty, would be we'd have to do the laminoplasty over multiple levels so that the spinal cord can actually drift away or drift backwards away from that ventral disc. And so, you know, in a, in a nice lordotic spine such as here, where you've got compression over multiple levels, if I'm able to open up the canal, say, through a laminoplasty, the only way that treats this ventral compression is the spinal cord itself can actually drift backwards. It can actually drift away from the compression. So even with large discs or bone spurs, with enough levels decompressed dorsally in a lordotic or neutral spine, you can actually uh, achieve fairly good decompression of the spinal cord. Where that becomes problematic and why the dorsal operation is not very good uh, in the kyphotic spine, as we see here, is that here with the cord being draped over top of the kyphus here, even when you pull multiple levels of lamina away, the spinal cord is still kind of held or tethered uh, against that ventral compression. So Although it is an option in the kyphotic spine, obviously uh, it's much less uh, relevant and probably less effective uh, in that patient for this reason. So you, I always tell my trainees, this is the reason why most of the time a one-level, single-level laminectomy in the cervical spine is ineffective because it doesn't allow the spinal cord to drift backwards away from the ventral compression. So even if I've got a one-level compression in the cervical spine, and I need to do a dorsal operation, I may do that over multiple levels uh, in order to try to allow the spinal cord to drift away. And so uh, that's why I think for this case, alignment uh, it really, really matters here. So again, going back to the choice of approach, if we try to put this as an algorithm, if the patient's kyphotic or mostly ventral compression, 
Uh, and there's, you know, very focal disease, one level disc osteophyte, two level disc osteophyte. For me, that's someone I'll treat with a anterior cervical discectomy infusion, maybe a disc arthroplasty. Uh, but if it's a diffuse disease, you know, over three levels, if it's that patient with uh, um, OPLL ossification of the ligament, as we mentioned, with more than two levels, perhaps this one is somebody I'm doing with a corpectomy infusion or even considering a laminectomy infusion uh, as well as an option. Uh, and if the patient's neutral, um, has dorsal decompression or they're nicely lordotic, or it's over multiple levels, four levels of compression perhaps, um, if there's evidence of instability, I'm going to do a laminectomy infusion. Uh, and if it's somebody who has no instability, at least today at our center, that's more likely we're going to do a laminoplasty in this uh, in this patient. So laminoplasty has been an operation we've really embraced um, lately as a, as a good approach for these patients that are lordotic, multiple levels, no instability uh, is, a good, is a good approach for that. Now, again, I don't think we can forget just doing regular laminectomy. Um, we don't do this very often uh, here in, at Cleveland Clinic uh, um, for really the complications associated with this. The, the advantage of a laminectomy alone, obviously, is it's very easy, it's very safe, it's, or it's, and it's very fast, it's very effective. Um, the downside is there tend to patients tend to develop a post-laminectomy kyphosis, especially if you do a multi-level laminectomy. You know, some of the data would suggest even as high as 25% chance or greater of post-laminectomy kyphosis, uh, and that can result in worsening neurological symptoms over time. So at least here, very rarely uh, do we do just a laminectomy alone uh, because of these uh, because of these issues. Uh, and that's why laminectomy and a lateral mass fusion has become much, much more common in these scenarios. Again, it's easy, uh, uh, very low complication rate, I think, when you compare it to an anterior corpectomy and an ACDF. Now, both of these approaches actually have very low complication rates, but if you compare an anterior approach versus a dorsal approach, uh, uh, the complication rate is lower dorsally because you don't have to worry about any of the vasculature, the nerve supply, um, the, the esophagus, et cetera. The disadvantage is, again, you're going to fuse now much many more levels, so motion is, a, is an impact. Um, I think there's much more disability in the posterior aspect of the neck with a dorsal approach, laminectomy infusion. The recovery tends to be longer, blood loss tends to be longer, uh, and they can get some atrophy in the musculature in the back of the neck. It can be very cosmetically uh, displeasing. And so there are some disadvantages uh, 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 to this approach. Um, and so laminectomy probably take out the equation. Uh, but what about laminoplasty? As I mentioned, this is something um, that we have really embraced to a greater extent. The advantages here is you're not doing a fusion. You can really open up the spinal canal. Uh, it's a technically, technically easy operation. It does preserve motion. Um, uh, we tend to, nowadays, this shows a laminoplasty all the way down the neck. We tend to not include C3. So if C3 is involved, we'll either do a laminectomy uh, of C3 or a dome, you know, a laminectomy uh, and start the laminoplasty at C4, uh, 5, and 6, and then do a laminectomy at C7. So I think that we used to worry a lot about neck pain, uh, but now that we do the, the a more of a laminectomy of C3 and C7 and the laminoplasty within the subaxial spine, subaxial spine patients tend to do a little bit better with regards to neck pain. But remember, they do still lose some motion and they do kyphose to some extent as well. Um, uh, so, but it is a good operation for these uh, cervical myelopathy patients uh, that, you know, again, predominantly do not have a lot of neck pain uh, and have good neutral uh, alignment or maintain cervical lordosis. Now, I think what's important here also is to look at, you know, the impact here is, you know, we think about a laminectomy, we remove the entire lamina and the canal opens up very widely, which is great. And some have worried about laminoplasty, just sort of opening the door of a laminoplasty a little bit. But remember, the opening is proportional to pi uh, with the radius squared. And so what that shows is you only need very small increases in an open door laminoplasty to have a much bigger impact on the overall dynam diameter of the spinal canal, okay, because it's, it's proportional to the, to the radius squared. And so, so even small changes or small openings in those laminoplasty uh, open door can have a huge impact on the space available for the spinal canal. Uh, which again just goes back to the strength uh, in the in the um, workhorse ability uh, of this operation. We tend to use uh, a variety of the of the modified Hirabashi technique. You know, an open door laminoplasty using titanium plates. 
uh, is kind of what we what we use here. I know there's a variety of other laminal plastics out there, the um, uh, French door perhaps, et cetera. But uh, I think the open door laminal plasti uh, with titanium plates tends to be one of the easiest approaches uh, approaches here. So again, I think we throw out laminectomy primarily. We look at lamin infusion, you know, and how do we go at, about deciding to do a fusion in a laminectomy versus a laminoplasty. And I think it has to do, again, with the alignment of the neck. Again, you probably want somebody who does not have a lot of neck pain to start with. Um, and you want somebody who has fairly good range of motion. So here's a patient, 61, has progressive spondylotic myelopathy. They've got, as you see on the MRI, three-level disease, you know, probably four. Their neck on x-ray is neutral. On the MRI, it's lordotic. There's really no segmental instability. So, you know, how do we approach this patient if we're going to do this? This is a good, in my hands, this is a good dorsal operation. Four levels of compression, uh, good lordotic spine, uh, not segmental unstable. How am I going to approach that patient? So I like this patient from a dorsal approach. Uh, again, do they have a lot of neck pain? Uh, that may impact me. You know, I'm going to say no in this patient, not a lot of neck pain. Uh, but if, if they had significant neck pain, maybe I'd change that. You know, how much of it is myelopathy versus radiculopathy? That may approach, you know, change how I approach that. And again, looking at the flexion extension cervical x-rays here, uh, this patient has fairly good maintained range of motion in their neck. So again, I think this is a patient that I would take uh, and do a laminoplasty on. I can open up the canal well. I don't have to worry about a fusion. I can maintain that range of motion uh, and treat their myelopathy very effectively. And so that was the treatment for, uh, for that uh, patient. Um, all right, so that, that takes us through our options surgically. Now, what does the evidence, uh, evidence show with regards to myel myelopathy? As I, as I mentioned before, you know, not a lot of the natural history data was old. And a lot of the medical evidence was old as well, up into, up even into the early 2000s, where we thought that, you know, patients really don't get better. They just stay stable. You know, we don't operate on mild patients, right? Um, and that was kind of the way we approached these patients. But in 2013, we started to see a significant amount of liter literature uh, uh, published looking at all of these uh, questions. And a lot of it came out through the AO uh, spine group uh, and their uh, – cervical spondylotic study. And so a lot of what I'm going to show here next uh, is data from, uh, from the AO looking at this. Um, but here is looking at uh, decompression. You know, is it safe? Is it efficacious? Uh, is it efficacious, efficacious in these patients with CSM? This was, again, data from their prospective observational study. They looked at functional outcomes, about 278 patients. Now, what's important here uh, is they looked at all grades, okay? And so, and they looked at, you know, uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy score, MJOA. They looked at neuric grades. So they looked at disability scores, NDI, and uh, functional scores, the SF36. And what they found here uh, is across all grades looking out to 12 months is that patients that, op that you operated on actually just didn't stabilize, that they improved, okay? So they improved functionally, they improved from disability and quality of life that one year for all diseases, mild, moderate, and severe. So this is, I think, one of their earlier studies that actually showed that it's not just about stopping the progression of the disease. It's actually about improving their outcomes, okay, which I think is, which is important looking at these patients moving forward. Uh, there were a number of studies out there looking at should I operate anteriorly or posteriorly. Again, this is data from the AO looking at their um, CSM study. Again, it's prospective. It's observational. It's multi-centered, and it's focusing just on that same group of patients looking at anterior and posterior. And again, looking at CSM-specific scores, MJOA, looking at you know, disability and, and functional outcomes. And really, they found no difference between their anterior and posterior patients with regards to uh, uh, myelopathy and functional outcomes. So really arguing you could do it anterior or posterior uh, for this group. Now, there's a lot of bias in this study. Uh, there's a lot of selection bias. Demographics are somewhat different. So they did go back and do a propensity match study. Uh, and so you can see here with demographics, now uh, everything is matched, use propensity scoring. So a little bit better taking out bias. Uh, but here again, showing, looking at operative time, length of stay, uh, and looking now at two-year outcomes with MJOA and DI, SF36, so disability, functional outcome, 
and myelopathy scores. Again, really no difference uh, in their uh, in their two year outcome. Again, arguing that you could do this anterior, you can do this posterior. Uh, as long as you get the spinal cord decompressed, and that's got to be the message here. You've got to get the cord decompressed. The outcomes are going to be the same, uh, and the complication rates are the same. Now, our group, uh, our group has had some interest in this. We've been working with uh, Zogo Gawala's group out of Leahy in Boston. Uh, we've been part at Cleveland Clinic here looking at the CSM trial, uh, which the, the, the latest data is going to be coming out very soon. We just submitted a paper to New England Journal of Medicine, and, and Zoe is actually going to present some of this data um, at CSRS. So I'm not going to talk about the most current data, but this is some of the early data that we have actually looked at. And one of the early things we looked at is comparative effectiveness uh, of ventral versus dorsal surgery for CSM. Uh, so our study is different from the AO early on. This was just a pilot study of 50 patients, so completely non-randomized, so a lot of bias in this. Uh, but we looked at two-year data, uh, 28 patients had ventral surgery, 22 dorsal surgery, average age 60s. Uh, baseline data was fairly similar, although the dorsal patients had more severe myelopathy. Um, and interesting what we found here, again, it's 50 guys, but we saw greater... Uh, quality of life improvements after ventral surgery, so favoring ventral. Uh, complication rate, no real difference between anterior and posterior. Uh, both groups improved from a myelopathy standpoint, okay? Their MJOA scores improved fairly similarly. Um, but dorsal surgery had a longer hospital stay, uh, greater costs uh, as well. So again, this one kind of argued a little bit more for uh, a little bit more for dors dorsal surgery, uh, sur sur sorry, ventral surgery, but both improved their MJOA and the argument here was really to do a much larger operation. So that data is coming out soon. Like I said, we just submitted it for publication. It's kind of interesting uh, what the current data supports out of the CSM trial. The other thing we looked at at CSM is really um, sagittal balance, right? So we've been focusing on the deformity end, looking at you know balance in the thoracolumbar spine. And uh, there's been a resurgence largely you know, from Chris Ames and others of looking at sagittal cervical balance and outcome. And so our interest was looking at this sort of C2, um, C7 sagittal vertical axis for these patients with myelopathy and trying to understand is there any impact on their outcome. And so, again, it's taken the data out of the CSM trial uh, that we put in uh, and assessed outcome based on the, the SVA. Um, so this was 49 patients. Uh, we looked at both preoperative and postoperative SVAs uh, and looked at outcomes with, you know, MJOA, ODI, and the SF36 and quality of life with DQ5D. Um, and again, what we found is most patients improved, which makes sense. You decompress them, they get better. Um, but both the preoperative and the postoperative C2 to C7 SVA were independently, uh, were independent predictors of outcome uh, in this patient cohort. And so what it showed is those patients that we did not correct their, um, their, their cervical balance, left them out of balance, okay, leaving their SVA greater than four centimeters, they actually did not improve from a quality of life standpoint. So their SF36 scores did not get better despite them getting better with myelopathy. So what does that say? It, it says that patients' myelopathy may be improved, but if you leave them fused out of balance, actually their, qual their quality of life does not improve. It actually gets worse. So I think we've got to really focus on that sagittal vertical axis with these patients. So again, uh, it was inversely related to SF36. So as the sagittal balance got worse, uh, their quality of life scores got worse as well. So that's something to keep in mind. And so we've got to, the data now uh, does support focusing on, on that and try to make sure that we probably correct this when it's out of alignment um, and be very careful with our surgeries, especially dorsal surgeries, that when we fuse patients, we keep their, their C2 uh, cervical uh, SVA uh, in uh, within about four centimeters from them. So uh, this is just the last few slides. Again, when we summarize this, I think the presentation of these patients with myelopathy is fairly typical uh, with their signs and symptoms. Uh, we know more about the natural history now. Um, our approach to both uh, um, their indications for surgery uh, and the type of surgery we do can be somewhat uh, algorithmic, all right? We can kind of define that in the algorithms as we put out. Uh, we know from an outcomes, it's not just stability. Uh, patients actually do get better. They do improve. Uh, even those that have very mild symptoms do get better. So I think we've got to keep that in mind uh, as we look at these patients. 
Um, there is still some disagreement between anterior and posterior surgery, right? Uh, I think many of the studies, including the AO study, show that you know anterior and posterior is equal. They do equally as well. Um, I think uh, I think all of us will be interesting to see what the CSM study is going to show with regards to anterior versus dorsal laminoplasty. And remember that sagittal cervical balance does matter. It appears to be critical with regards to functional outcome in these patients, regardless of their improvement in myelopathy. So again, patients with myelopathy aren't happy when they have a lot of neck pain afterwards. They tend to score very low on quality of life. So we've got to get their uh, cervical alignment uh, uh, equally as, as good uh, as we do their cord uh, decompression. And why don't I, I guess, why don't I stop there? I've got some cases uh, that I could show as well. Some uh, simple, some getting a little bit more complex. I could also show them if you want, and we can sort of poll the, the, our debaters and see how they would approach this. Um, or we could go on to uh, uh, just uh, questions at this point. Yes, you go ahead. And at the end of your cases, we can continue with the, okay. our case. Okay, now some of these cases are very simple. Why don't I just show them, and we'll just see what, the, uh, what our panel would do, okay, and how they would, how they would approach these patients. So, so um, the first case uh, is this is, and, and all these patients have myelopathy, so there's no, there's no tricks to any of them with regards to the neurological findings. So it is a 70-year-old uh, who's got signs of, say, moderate myelopathy, loss of hand dexterity, and imbalance. And here is the uh, cervical x-ray. Uh, here is the MRI uh, at the C4-5 level, uh, and the patient has moderate myelopathy. Um, uh, does anybody want to uh, take that on, on how they would approach this case? So I think all the panelists can uh, open the video and um, the audio so we can discuss a little bit. Uh, okay. Azdrubo, would we want to make a comment about this specific case? Yeah. Uh, in this case, with one level anterior decompression, I think that is, is the best choice in my hands. You say, as Drew, you say the anterior, like an anterior discectomy fusion? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I, I love multi-level discectomy instead okay. of corpectomy. So I think that uh, a, a good drilling of the posterior bone it's, okay. it's, it's going to be a good decompression for this case. Are you, are you concerned about any of this? Uh, if, say, this is disc or osteophyte that's a little bit more cranial on the C4 vertebral body or even this, you know, this ligament of flavum, which is buckling in the spinal cord here at all, are you concerned with any of that or you feel like you can do this uh, through uh, a single level? I feel that from anterior approach, I can, with drilling, drill a little bit the posterior part of the vertebral body. Okay. And, and, and just give a more low doses, okay. like a, a um, ligament on taxis for, okay. for this case is going to be great. Sure. Yes. Wait, is anybody concerned about this, this ligament and flavum that buckles in? Is that, does everybody feel that, uh, that this is an anterior single level operation or would anybody do a anterior posterior operation or all posterior? Yes. I would like to say uh, something if I can. Yes, I would like to know if you have CT scan for this patient because this changes, this osteophytes at the anterior vertebral body, the C, C5 or C, C4. C4. Sorry. So what, how would it change? What if I told you that that was all ossified on CT scan? Because, okay, if the, if the ligamentum flavum is calcified and uh, you have a, a huge osteophyte here, Maybe we'll change the approach. No, yeah. no single disc level uh, 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 surgery. Maybe a prepectomy could be. And it's possible if you do not uh, uh, finish the decompression, uh, you need to decompress the posterior area too. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I don't mean to, I, I apologize for trying to ask you that question that way. I was using it more because I knew you would tell the audience that you're absolutely right. You know, we're, I, let's say we have a CT scan here and that is not. There's no ossification. That's just soft disc herniation. Okay. So would anybody consider an arthroplasty here? Is anybody doing uh, disc replacement or, or cervical arthroplasty for patients with myelopathy? Or would everybody consider probably more a fusion if they were going to operate on this? Yeah, well, probably, not in, probably not in this case, but uh, I want to hear uh, what uh, Oscar has to say about this because he is very enthusiastic with uh, arthroplasty. 
but I don't think myelopathy is a contraindication if you have a soft disc and you still have movement. Uh, there's no contraindica formal contraindication for arthroplasty. So I, I think, hey, uh, uh, you want to make a question first? Yeah, I, I don't think there's here an indication for arthroplasty because uh, there are severe degenerative changes in the, in the assets, first of all. Uh, I, I, in this case, I, I, there's, it's clear that we have to go anteriorly to a wide decompression and only one level. Uh, the indication for anterior surgery is uh, we have a, a little bit kyphosis here. I see at uh, C4, C5. So I think with only one level, and I, I won't worry about the posterior uh, compression at this moment in this case. Yeah, yeah. Okay. May, may I ask about uh, what kind of ACDF would you perform? I mean, uh, cage and plate or um, any kind of um, cage with screws, something like this? Is that is that to me or to the pa to uh, to the panel? Oh, for for Henny. He is he's seventy years. He, the, the the bone. I don't think the bone is, is strong. I, I may put the cage and the, and and the, and the plate in this case. In this case, usually, if in younger patients, I would put maybe only one cage for one level. It works, but in this case, uh, I, I I in order to uh, correct uh, the alignment maybe and uh, to uh, for the fusion more secure if I put a cage and the plane. What, what kind of cage I think, would you... I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to to use the excellent algorithm what you show in your in your lecture. The lordosis is perfect or it's good for the patient. The patient is elderly and the vector is absolutely anterior. So I don't have any doubt the, the best way to approach is anteriorly. Yeah, I think I think, and I'll, I'll show you what I did. Uh, but I think all of this was dis is excellent discussion on a fairly straightforward case. I think the fear for me is that, is that a, is that ossified, right? And so that would change the change my approach. Uh, I've had a few cases that have ligamentum buckling like this that I've had to go back if I've done an anterior only and gone back and done a small posterior decompression. But I think with some distraction. Uh, which was initially uh, shed, sh uh, discussed by Struble, I think that that would probably straighten out. Uh, and then I think, again, there's no right answer. Nobody knows the answer of using it. You could you put it in a single cage, no plate, cage and plate, bone graft and plate. I don't think we really know um, the right answer here. I think, again, your discussion around is it is it the patient older, softer bone, et cetera. What, what we've been using more here are these 3D printed uh, titanium cages um, that will have a little closer modulus of elasticity to normal bone, so it's not as rigid, uh, and allowing a little bit more bone in growth. So I probably would use that. This is older, so this is a, I'll show you the case, is a, just a, piece, a, a bony allograft uh, with a single level plate, uh, and, the, and the patient did very well. I think today uh, I would probably use a, uh, a, a lordotic uh, uh, um, 3D printed titanium cage uh, with a plate, uh, and that's just personal preference. There's, I have no evidence to support you know, support that moving forward. And I think I could do that without doing the dorsal. Okay, let's go on to one that's a, maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, not as straightforward. Uh, is this okay if we do this like this, just present some cases? Everybody okay with that? Cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is a so, 60. 60 somebody, your... somebody in the panel is uh, asking about titanium versus speak in the last case. Yeah, does, it, does anybody have a comment on, on, on that? I mean, I think I can tell you my, my, my uh, feeling is, uh, peak uh, is inert and does not integrate into bone. And so you're completely relying on the bony growth through the middle of the cage. Uh, now, cervical, anterior cervical cages tend to fuse very well. The advantage is obviously that you can uh, have better radiographic binding of fusion with the peak cage versus titanium. But I, I think the, the, the newer um, 3D printed cages tend to have the advantages of both. They tend to have a closer modulus of elasticity to bones, so they're, they're not as rigid, they're not as stiff. Um, they allow good bone growth into the cage and through the cage. Uh, and then I found that the uh, X-ray or CT scan is still a little bit hard to interpret because of the uh, because of the titanium. But you're able to see through the middle of the cage and get an idea if there's if there's bone graft. So, so that's just a personal uh, issue. I've never been a huge fan of peak cages here. I know a lot of people use them. 
Um, but I think the for me the these three D printed uh, titanium pages I like a lot better nowadays. Okay. Okay. So this this is a go ahead. Was it, is there another? Should I, should I go ahead? Okay. So this is a another patient who's a sixty eight or eight year old woman. Uh, this patient got flown in by a helicopter because she's become fairly acutely weak, uh, fairly fast. So she's got an acute myelopathy, arm weakness, leg weakness, loss of balance. Um, it's a little less relevant why this is important, but had a, had a bite by a cat at work. Uh, patient came in with fever uh, and fairly acute, uh, uh, rapid uh, weakness and as, as a myelopathy. So uh, this is, I think, maybe it doesn't come off entirely as clear, but what, this, what I'm meaning here is that the patient has classic acute myelopathy, very weak in the hands and the, you know, the distal arms and much stronger in the distal legs. So, you know, classically uh, a, a myelopathic patient, okay? Here is the CAT scan. I'm going to show a couple different images. Here's the CAT scan uh, of this patient. So it has fever uh, and has uh, rapid acute myelopathy. Here's the CAT scan. Uh, and this patient has an MRI uh, with contrast. And, and these are the levels, uh, uh, these are the level with contrast uh, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, four, five, uh, five, uh, five, six, uh, and a little bit at six, seven. So uh, showing uh, the, the pathology here of this, uh, you know, fairly large uh, epidural abscess, uh, uh, prevertebral abscess, uh, and the abscess you can see is very is significantly ventral uh, as well, you know, through this area of pathology uh, uh, here. And so here, I think the case, if we break it up in a simple way, is 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 the disease is somewhat different because it's an infection, um, but it's a patient with kyphosis now uh, over multiple levels and uh, and myelopathy. Um, so d does anybody want to uh, take a, a, a kind of a stand on how they would approach this patient? Dr. Dietmar, would you like uh, to comment on some, something? Well, easy case? The, uh, this is the easiest case that you're going to ask me. This. <laughs> <laughs> this is so difficult. Uh, obviously, trying to do it for a material would be very difficult. I, I would go from dorsal try and correct as much as I can, see what the infection is about, see if I can treat it uh, with medication. And, so you, but I, I don't know if I, I you know, I, I don't know if I could do it from the, from the front and trying to correct with all this infection in the front. But you have so abscess. The, you have abscess in the, in, in the front. And so, yes, there's a big abscess there. Yeah, yeah. so you, you, you can resolve the abscess from the back. If you go only posteriorly, yeah. But but how about how about if you? I don't know. Do you have any dynamic X-rays there? Does I do it, not. You know, did, I do not. Yeah. Uh, but just what for the for it? the uh, for the for the entire group listening, what what would what would you do with a dynamic X-ray? Would it, if what would you change if you found you know that it moved? If it reduced or didn't? Like what would you use the dynamic X-rays for? And I, I'm only asking this simply yeah. for the. All the participants, so they they have a better understanding. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, just, in, in this. Sorry. Oh, Mike. In, 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 in this case, me. In in this case, uh, uh, it's the compression is mainly anterior. I think that uh, I'll do if the first approach is going to be anterior approach, and corpac to me the compression, and this is a classic. Uh, case that I do a combined approach is osteoporosis, multi-segmental kyphosis, instability. I, I usually do combined an approach. I the first approach is the approach where the compression are. So I go front and then back. Okay. A any a any comment on as you will, any comment Oscar, on Oscar Alves? Would you like to comment on me? I, yeah, I, mean, I think here it's it's myelopathy and deformity. We need to correct deformity. Uh, you need to address the, the, the infection, so you need to really go from the front, do the brightment, and I would do a three-level corpectomy. And because of the age, because of poor bone quality related to infection, second stage, uh, I would fix it from the back. So I'm pretty, pretty much with the uh, on on this uh, case. 
Would you do, how, what levels would you do? You said a three-level corpectomy. How about posteriorly, uh, dorsally, what oh, would you? I, I would do uh, above and below at least one level more. You think? So, like, down to uh, first thoracic? Here. Or? So, yeah, corpectomy, I want to four, five, and six, and posterior three to, uh, to, to, to T1, probably. But, but... Uh, yeah. I was, I was what, what about what about the timing? Yeah, I, uh, in relation with with your comment, I have, I have a comment, Doctor Soriano. Uh, she has like three problems: is she has an, an acute infection, uh, kyphosis, and probably instability. So first, you go anterior, and you have to uh, clear, clean that, I mean, uh, wash everything, um, see what you have and uh, how is the infection, and probably in the same time you need to go to posterior, posterior to, to fix that. I mean, and then, in, in the last time, probably a reconstruction anterior and posterior when you have a, a control of the infection. Otherwise, it's difficult because if you have a, put something anterior, uh, probably the infection keep, keep uh, going. Yeah. I, Dr. Brock, do you have any other opinion? Deeper uh, opinion? No, I will do it by the front, uh, corpectomy, five and six, and uh, always cleaning and take samples of the of the bacteria and put in a telescopic um, cage on the front first, probably with a plate, and wait for a while to go back uh, from, from the back after the, the infection was probably correct. I, I have a comment. This, this, this is an emergency surgery. This is a life threatening case. We have to go mandatory anteriorly, five, six decompression, because, because most of the vertebra are infected here, five and six. And I would, I would put implant, and there's no problem to put implant to clean everything and in a second, maybe, maybe not necessary, maybe she will, may need another posterior surgery. But this is an emergency surgery, it's a life-threatening uh, case because of the infection that she has. So this Ricardo down. Botello, Ricardo Botello wants... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. To come on. Hi, everybody. Oh. I think that uh, what is new in this patient is the infection. The deformity is, is old. And not the cause of the problems. First, I would treat the infection from anterior approach. And the second and after, I will try to uh, operate the deformity. At first, by anterior approach, and the compression by the second, two the second, one the second, C5, C6. May I ask um, Luis Carelli? Luis Carelli is, is an orthopedic surgeon who has a huge experience with uh, cervical deformity here in Brazil. Uh, Carelli, can you hear me? Can, can I please make a comment about what do you think about the, the emergency treatment and um, the need of uh, correct deformity as well in the first uh, approach, please? I, I have a, near the same opinion as the other participants. I start this case by the front, remove two vertebral bodies, try to correct as much as possible by distraction. And in the same day, if the patient was stable by hemodynamic or, or the septic, the anesthesiology team allowed to do the posterior in the same day, I try to do both anterior and posterior in the same day. And the, you can, in this case, in the, the another case, in the, the old case, the first one, you can see some C2 slope. The C2 slope is a measuring that you can find that the disease is in the cervical region. And we try to correct it. Also, the two main reasons of the patient. First, the myopathy as a 
spondylolytic or in this case as infection and in the same in the same day or stage of the procedure try to correct the amount of the deformity as you have experience to correct with less morbidity it's my opinion try to do in the same day and try to correct the the deformity as much as possible Okay, I think I'll ask you, uh, yes. raise your hand. So, uh, uh, let's let's you hear a uh, uh, last opinion. moment about this case. Yes, I think uh, most most of the important things have already been uh, said. But one thing that is I think is really important because you are operating on a patient with an ongoing infection, acute infection. So I think it's very timorous to perform the anterior approach and not perform the posterior approach. And if you lose this support, this anterior support, these things might get much worse. So I will also uh, try to do the anterior decompression, probably the C5 and C6, but I would like to see a CT scan before to see the quality of the bone. And also try to do the posterior approach to stabilize as soon as possible, the same day or as soon as possible because... I think the anterior alone will not be enough. I think it's very uh, important to organize the ideas. Among the three problems of the patient, absolutely the more important, the more essential is the infection. It's written in life, as uh, Hani said. So uh, the first step is absolutely to control, how to control the infection. And uh, we know uh, in relation with the abscess, it's very important the debridement, and uh, I'm not sure if, uh, in the first moment it's very important to fix the spine. It's a rigid spine, and the and the spine is not too too much compressed. So, uh, what about what do you uh, what is your opinion, Mike? Yeah, so Mike's statements. So, I, I mean, this has been an excellent discussion. Let me let me ask the panel one more question, and I'll then I'll kind of went through how went through how we did it. If you're going to, we heard um, um, Hanny talk about putting in a, a t an expandable cage. What would the, does anybody have concerns about putting bone graft in versus titanium cage versus peak cage? Does anybody have strong feelings about the type of implant? Because it sounds like most are going to do a corpectomy. So what about the bone graft or the graft you want to use? Yeah, I, I, I would use the titanium on infection today. It is not a problem. Maybe stainless steel is, is a problem, but for the titanium, it is not. And it is much stronger if you use titanium than, than the graft. Uh, and uh, you can use uh, screws and, uh, and plate from C4 to C7. The problem, if you go uh, after the uh, anterior fusion, anterior stabilization, you can't correct from, from the posterior because you have already stiff from the front. So the only reason to 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 do a posterior approach here is to stabilize is, is to make it stronger but you can't do any correction if you go from c4 c5 c6 c7 from the front with the with the big cage and with screws how you can correct the deformity from the back you can't do it so from the back is only to avoid uh, any right. failure of the, of, of the right. implant right right right, right. I, have a, I have a question i have a comment here. An opinion I have, an, I have a comment uh, is asking the world. Uh, you know, it was said by Guy about the telescopic cage. I would never use a telescopic cage here. You know, due to the bad quality of bone, infection, old patient, you need some solid construct. So I would use here a titanium mesh filled with autologous bone and the plate, of course. But never, never trust in, in the hardware, never a telescopic cage. So titanium, so titanium. Okay, so I'll, I'll, for the sake of time, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go through what we did. So it was an excellent uh, conversation, uh, hitting all the important points. Here's a patient who has an acute myelopathy. It's infection. She's progressive, uh, has some destruction of bone, kyphosis, you know, anterior, posterior. How much do you do at first? Do you do part of anterior first, posterior second? So how we approached this was uh, an anterior, posterior um, all of the same day um, and did a, uh, a two-level corpectomy and a single-level um, ACDF. I'll, I'll kind of show the x-ray and then I'll go to the MRI, which is a little bit clearer. So uh, a C5-6 corpectomy with allograft, 
Okay, so I think if I did this today, I'd probably use titanium mesh cage with a, a you know with bone graft, uh, but used allograft uh, fibular fibular allograft, a single level ACDF uh, at the uh, C four five area, uh, sorry, C three four area. Uh, excuse me, maybe C four five. I got to show the MRI get the levels again um, at the uh, C three four level, uh, and then uh, five six perfectomy. Uh, and then posteriorly C3 down to T2. And I'll, let me show the MRI. We'll show it a little bit clearer. But did it all in the same day um, and had fairly good, uh, um, uh, at least not creating lordosis, but at least straightening the cervical spine anteriorly. Uh, this is two days afterwards, but with a plate from C2 to C7 uh, with a two-level corpectomy and a single-level ACDF uh, that at least straightened out the cervical spine and then went posteriorly C3 to T2 to just hold uh, as was mentioned, not any more correction, just sort of hold it uh, in place. Uh, and you can see the progression of the MRI uh, over time uh, with uh, some improvement of the swelling of the spinal cord and some of the cord signal. And the patient actually had some pretty significant improvement uh, in her uh, myelopathy fairly acutely over time uh, where, she, where, she got, where she got better. And so uh, any comments on that? Was that would any, was allograft a bad idea? This ended up being successful. The patient... It's hard to argue an outcome. The patient did well, uh, but any comments of, of, of negativity on that with regards to uh, not correcting her more? We have good sagittal cervical balance, uh, I think, on X-ray. Um, you know, her, her sagittal vertical axis at C2 to 7 will be good. Uh, we had good fixation. We acutely decompressed her and then held it in place. And like I said, she did improve uh, with her as her infection was treated over time. Uh, Dr. Dr. Simons. What's asking the world? I'd like to... Ronald, go ahead. My telephone. Ronald Faria. Enough. Ronald? Uh, no, he has the microphone enough. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Congratulations for the, brand, the, the, the surgery, but I would have treated in a different way. I would have treated in two steps. First of all, I would, from the front, of course, I would open up the two discs in space at C4, C5, C5, C6, and remove the discs and put a iliac graft, a very high one, and then put a core and observe. Treat aggressively with antibiotics, and then in a second step, I would do the reconstruction from the back. That's my opinion. Yeah, and that, and that and I think that that would have worked. I, I think there's different ways to do this, but I think the important thing is the discussion we've had, which has been excellent, which has discussed all the important points of this with regards to the infection, the the acute nature, uh, and do you address the deformity? Uh, and if you do, you know how aggressive do you approach it? Because here. You know, how much risk do you want to put this patient through with regards to any deformity correction versus deformity stabilization? So that's how we approach this is we did not want to get significant lordosis. We just wanted to get the patient back into some semblance of balance, cervical balance, and then hold the patient fused uh, in that nature. Uh, uh, Michael, I have, uh, I have Michael, a uh, quick I comment on, on, on the technical issue. It's an excellent job, but from the posterior, why did you stop at T2 or T1, because uh, my concern is whenever you go from the cervical thoracic junction, it is a very weak from the uh, biomechanical construction. And you may, I, I have seen some failures of the, of the, of the distal screws because of this, just this biomechanical uh, change between the cervical and the thoracic spine. So the question, if, if I could stop at G7 in this case, may be sufficient or not? Uh, well, I mean, I think the answer is probably yes. The the last uh, level involved on the anterior plate is C7. Yes. Um, it, and if you look at the C7, T1, I don't, I don't have on the standing x-ray pre-op to look at the T1 slope or, you know, try to understand the cervical thoracic junction, but it looks fairly level. You know what I mean? I guess you could argue to stop at C7. I just worried that you have a long lever with a two-level vertebrectomy uh, and just ending at C7. Is that going to be mechanically sound enough? And that's why extended down into the thoracic spine it may it may have worked just fine by ending at c7 but i think for me um with this long level construct two level vertebrectomy 
the bone is going to be somewhat involved from the infection. I wanted to get as long of a construct as possible. So that was my argument to go in the thoracic spine. Mike, how, how many uh, time do you take to, to make the two procedures in, a, in oh, wow. a, uh, 70 years old? Yeah, probably because a good I amount of time. Is... Yeah. The, the corpectomy, the anterior part, part probably took, you know, minimum, you know, four hours, I would say minimum. I don't remember the exact amount of time. The posterior a little faster because it's just putting in the screws, but you could still see that this is, you know, minimum six to seven, you know, to maybe eight hours of surgery um, in this patient uh, all at one time. Who's older and infection. We think that this is a little bit risky to take too much time in this kind of patients. I mean, uh, I, look, I, I don't think I could argue against what many of the panelists said, maybe just do anterior surgery, decompress the cord, stabilize it, and then come back and do posterior. I had my argument was more that the patient had fairly extensive cord edema uh, infection that I wanted to get it completely decompressed and st stabilized all at once, and then give antibiotics and try to recover. So my argument was to try to do it all at once. But I, I can't argue. I, I I don't think that you could say it would be wrong to do the anterior procedure first and then in a delayed fashion do the posterior procedure. I I, I could not argue against that. We just chose to do it all at once quickly. Is as quickly as we could to try to get it all fixed. Something in the in the chat is asking about if you uh, use any kind of intraoperative traction during the procedure. Any tra no, not for this. I, I don't think it's unreasonable to put the patient in uh, some uh, um, Gardner Wells tongs to place some inline traction uh, to help with this. This patient, we did not. We just used some gravity. Uh, we can take the. Uh, uh, a, uh, a blanket from underneath the head once the corpectomy is done and the discectomy is done, lean the patient back, uh, and that's usually enough, at least in my hands, to get the patient at least in this position. So, so no, no specific gra uh, traction uh, in this patient. But I don't think it's, again, unreasonable to use that. We often use it in cervical deformities uh, to help straighten the spine. Can I make a question? Ask a question. So what is the, what's the problem of treating only the infection and uh, only with disectomy and treating the infection and then to operate the, the deformity later? What's the problem? I don't think, and if, if, it, for, if you're asking me, Estrubal, I don't think that there's a problem. I would just worried in this case that I would not be able to adequate, adequately drain the abscess through discectomies. I wanted to do a multi-level vertebrectomy, you know, at the apex of the deformity, uh, largely because that was where the majority of the infection was, to clean that out, uh, and then just try to straighten the spine as much as possible. So I think to take your argument in another step, say this patient has a very rigid fixed deformity and has a dorsal infection, I'm going to just treat the infection uh, and not treat the deformity at that time. If I wanted to do the deformity, we would do it later. I think in this patient, it's very easy to do the deformity. If you do a vertebrectomy, a corpectomy, and a discectomy, it's, it's almost very simple to go from this picture to this picture without much effort. Uh, and so I think the idea here was to treat the myelopathy and the uh, infection, uh, but you just so happen to have the ability to at least straighten the spine here uh, through that operation. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I have an opinion. For me, this case is a vertebral destruction, and for that, I think the patient needs a fixed large and fixed uh, anterior and posterior because the syphosis noise is the same than the degenerative syphosis. For that, uh, the treatment, uh, I think, is, is good in this case. Yeah. Thank yeah, you, Armando. Uh, Mike, uh, I think it is a, a, a some uh, a case in which we can follow comment of a uh, whole day. It's a very yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. much uh, comment. But now Geronimo is going to come back with the Oscars case to complete okay. the, the review and, should, and take your opinion. Go, should, Geronimo, should I, go ahead, please. Should I stop sharing? Should I hit stop sharing? Yeah. Yes, please. And okay. then okay. let's discuss a little bit the uh, Oscars case. Uh, it's a very interesting case. Uh, Oscar, can you share your okay your screen, please? Yep. 
So thank, thank, so, thank uh, you. Uh, thank Maya, you. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, did it, did, did you uh, see the, the the case Oscar showed uh, in the beginning? Yeah, I, I was looking at this. Yeah, this was the uh, patient with the uh, underwent uh, trauma, had an acute traumatic myelopathy, um, and um, right, and that that's the case we're looking at now, I believe, right? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I, I kindly ask you to address during the discussion uh, about the, the, the case of a asymptomatic patient uh, with a spinal cord uh, sinal, because there are a lot of questions of the, the, the attendees about this. So let's discuss the case and just address the situation as well, please. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think this is the case we were talking about. So I, I guess my question for this case so if I remember the story, the patient was in a, a, a motor vehicle accident, I believe, and presented with symptoms of a central cord injury, if, if I'm correct. Uh, and so I, I guess my question I would ask before deciding on surgery would be if, if the patient is improving while in the uh, trauma room or in the emergency room, are they getting any improvement in their neurological symptoms? Or are they just staying the same? They, they came in weak and they're staying weak. So really, really no improvement. He was okay, getting okay. worse, and okay. um, so we. The story is that we we had this patient track back two years before. He was uh, asymptomatic, doing an MRI just because of neck pain, but not specific neck pain, and so that compression yeah. was almost what you see now two years later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And because it was asymptomatic, no decision to operate was, right. yeah. was done. Yeah. So the guy. He's obviously developed myelopathy during these two years, but never seek medical uh, attention. Yeah. And then at this minor RTA, and we see this MRI on, on August uh, uh, 2012. I got you. So I think some of, the, sorry. some of the question I think was brought up is how soon do you operate? You go acutely, do you do this uh, the next day? Do you do this in a week, in six weeks? Uh, because, again, there's been suggestion in these central cord patients that you could do them uh, in a delayed fashion and if they, you know, because they may improve. My, my, my stance on these patients is if I see them uh, when they first arrive uh, into the emergency department and they start improving neurologically while there, then maybe wait 24 hours, 48 hours to operate on them while they're improving. But if the patient comes in with a neurological deficit that doesn't improve, I think for me, that's an, an indication for an, an emergent uh, or a very urgent operation where I'm going to take them to surgery uh, fairly immediately for surgery. Uh, these are often in older patients. This patient's only 63, so fairly young. Uh, but if they were much older, if they were 83 and had medical comorbidities, maybe I would delay a little bit. Uh, but, uh, but I think a more urgent operation on this patient would be indicated. Um, and I think, I still think, I, I brought up this issue of laminoplasty. I think Easily, you could make an argument to do a one-level uh, corpectomy, so two, three, four, five, do a C5 corpectomy um, and do a, a C4 to C6 uh, uh, and, maybe, and maybe a C, C4 to C7 plate and do a C6-7 ACDF, so a one-level ACDF and a one-level corpectomy that would allow you to decompress this area very adequately and fuse the patient. But I think here for me, here's a patient who has good lordosis, uh, assuming the patient does not have neck pain. I didn't ask that preoperatively. So let, let me just assume the patient has minimal pre-injury neck pain. Uh, even with this disc uh, bulge, this ventral osteophyte uh, at, at whatever level this is, C5-6, I still think, for me, this is a patient I would do a laminoplasty on, or at least offer a laminoplasty. Um, I would do a, 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 a C4 uh, to C6 laminoplasty. Uh, and take and drill off the very top part of C7, like a dome laminectomy. Um, I think that that would be a nice way to do a non-fusion uh, decompression of the cord that would give the cord enough room to drift dorsally uh, and away from that mass. Uh, and since there's no instability, uh, no need uh, to do a fusion. So I think for me, uh, that would be the operation I would do in this patient. Now, if the patient had a lot of neck pain before the injury, uh, then I probably would do this through a. That's uh, the case. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. That's the solution brought him to the to the to the doctor two years before. So neck yeah. pain was quite relevant. Yeah. So I would probably do a corpectomy of C five because C four C four five and C five six. Remember, 
Go ahead. Uh, so, would someone was saying. Something? Remember that. Yeah, he had a, a, a severe um, left carotid stenosis. Oh, does he really? I didn't hear that part of it. That's all on the on the past medical history. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And how about the how about the, I didn't hear that part. How about the right side? Good break. It was okay. It was okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think you're you're a little bit of risk here then um, of uh, doing a corpectomy uh, because of the carotid stenosis. So, oh, great! You threw me a uh, you threw me a curveball. Well, then then again, <laughs> I I, I um, if the patient has a lot of neck pain, I think the easiest. And the safest thing to do to avoid the carotid, uh, but any potential injury, um, uh, is to is to just do this dorsally. You could do a laminectomy uh, in a fusion if the patient had a lot of neck pain. Uh, you'd get the neck decompressed, stabilized, uh, and uh, and not put the carotid stenosis at risk uh, with regards to any dissection, uh, any retraction. Uh, I think that would be the easiest and quickest way to do that. Um, uh, I think in this approach, that's that's how I would approach that. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I have a comment on, on, on the central cord syndrome. Most cases, most, in many cases, they improve. So my first approach to the central cord syndrome, maybe not this case, is to observation. And if the patient improves, and may they improve, uh, it looks like dramatic because the, the patient is, is paraparetic, but they start moving the, 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 the lower extremities after a few days, most, many of them. So... In this case, if, 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 if after observation, 24, 48 hours or three days, it is, uh, is not improving, in this case, also, I may go from the back. Why? Because it's easy, safe, and effective, as Michael said, and it looks like the bone is healthy. I, I don't know if the three years waiting with the severe pain, I, 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 maybe she had mild pain, or actual pain, I mean. So in this case, uh, for more than three levels, I would go, I feel more comfortable to go from the back to uh, laminoplasty. It's very easy, nice, and friendly surgery, and uh, maybe less risky for the patient. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. I think the only thing that I, I, I guess I disagree a little bit with, but I can't, I can't disagree strongly is, is waiting. I, I know historically we've waited on these patients before we've operated. As you mentioned, many of them get better. But then many of them get better, then start to decline over time. But you're not recommending waiting a month from now. You're wait, waiting just a few days, I guess, is what you're saying. Now, I, I, that, but that's another reason too. I look at these patients if they are getting better. Some of them, some of them start getting better while you're observe, you know, while you're observing them in the emergency room, while you're ordering an MRI, while you're watching them. I think if that patient's getting better, I may wait. Uh, but if not, if they're staying the same, I still think for all risks, as long as there's no medical reason to not take them, I, I just feel more comfortable uh, taking them to surgery fairly quickly uh, and getting them uh, decompressed. Now, again, if it, let's say it's, um, let's say it's uh, 1 a.m. in the morning, uh, and this patient uh, is a central cord, uh, and I could operate on them at, uh, at 8 a.m. in the morning, maybe I'll wait to 8 a.m., maybe it's not an emergency, but I still think for me, um, unless there's a medical contraindication, I still would probably uh, operate on them fairly acutely. Uh, and I, I know the evidence behind that is not very strong, um, but I just think for me and with a cord injury, I like to get them decompressed. Yeah, here, here maybe the debate is... We have, we have, we have some uh, questions from the chats, and they are so, so many important. The number one is uh, if you uh, have any one recommendation for for me, in cervical myelopathy. And number two is, uh, do you recommend C1 laminectomy intention band syndrome? So, Mike. what was the what was the first question? Was any recommendations for cervical myelopathy or asymptomatic? For, for minimal invasive spine procedures. Oh, in for, uh, myelopathy. for myelopathy. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, in my uh, experience, and I do a fair amount of minimally invasive surgery. Um, the, the indication for, say, a minimally invasive laminectomy, right, done through a small tubular retractor dorsally uh, can be done at one level for sure, uh, maybe two levels. But I think um, that's a rare condition to have dorsal compression at one or two levels. So I think it can be done. It can be done through a tube, and just like we do in the lumbar spine with, a, with an over-the-top decompression, a unilateral hemilaminectomy, and then work over top of the spinal cord can be done uh, fairly easily. Uh, I just find that the patients, 
that present with one level laminectomy uh, that's more of a dorsal decompression is not very common. So I think it's more of an issue of how common uh, do you see those patients. Now, obviously, uh, I have not personally done this, but I've read now multiple papers where there are uh, people approaching uh, through a transdiscal uh, and even a transvertebral route endoscopically uh, to try to remove disc and osteophyte. I, I simply have no experience for that. I think that the anterior cervical discectomy infusion is so easy. It's so minimally invasive. I don't need another uh, approach anteriorly. I think that is minimally invasive. So again, it's a long answer, but dorsally, you can do it through a tubular MIS approach, one level, two levels maximum, at least in my opinion. But I, I find it rare that patients just, uh, you find that patient that can, that can have that done uh, for them. Um, and so hopefully that the panel agrees with me or not. I don't know if anybody is doing anything more uh, endoscopically from a ventral approach. Uh, again, I, I just fail to see the huge advantage of that with the, M, with the uh, ACDF. It's so easy. It's so minimally invasive. I don't, I don't think we're adding anything to that. Um, it, and, I, and I did not get the, oh, say I didn't get the second question about a C1, C1 laminectomy for uh, uh, tension band. Yes. Antonio, a question. What's the question? The question was, uh, what about the tension band syndrome? Yeah, I mean, after, I think... After laminectomy. Yeah, I think it's a definitely a true, it's a true uh, problem. I think we see that, I mean, if, I think what I'm, if I understand it correctly, meaning that maybe doing a laminectomy in somebody who has more of a kyphotic spine, if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, more of a kyphotic spine and you do the laminectomy and the spinal cord is not able to uh, drift back from the spinal cord, if I'm understanding that correctly, if I, I, I think I'm trying to understand the, the question. I think that's the mm. problem with a laminectomy. So if you're not able to remove enough bone or the spine is not lordotic enough to allow the spinal cord to decompress, uh, it's not going to work. You're going to have an ineffective operation regardless of doing a laminectomy. Uh, and, and that approach I'd probably, you know, push more for doing some combination of a ventral, of a ventral operation. Okay. Uh, I, I, I understand the question. Uh, 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 it's very important to know that we have nine minutes to finish the session, so uh, it's very I'm important, it's very important to complete the, the case. I have a Can quick comment the case? On, this, so, on this case. Uh, uh, just a quick comment. So, this, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. So, you know, this was this was the patient, uh, you know, with with the neurology, important neurology. So the, the idea was to offer an operation that you could offer a, a good decompression of the canal. A lordotic patient, multi-level. So we decide to do to, from the, from the back uh, laminectomy and fusion, not the laminoplasty because of the pre-trauma uh, significant neck pain. Yeah. This is this is what we get, and uh, this is an MRI done one month and a half after the operation. And to our surprise, you see that the the. the Due to ligament attack C effect, some distraction of the of the lateral mass screws, you can see that all that disappeared, and this is the the, the final result with a good shift of the posterior shift of the spinal cord. Yeah, that sh that sh your your MRI shows it very very well, where you can see like what I've been describing with the spinal cord is shifted very well posteriorly, you know, away from the uh, osteophytes, and you can also see. Again, some reabsorption of those osteophytes, and I think you know it's a combination of the fusion, perhaps, um, and uh, with lack of motion. Mike, it's, it's, it's something time. something you see in C1, C2 with the panels. Exactly right. You see it with the panels. Right? When when you do a fixation, posterior fixation. That's right. Some of these patients that are mildly myelopathic and have a large ventral panis in C1, C2, the operation is just a fusion, right, and the panis will disappear. And I think this is some of the similar thing. You need to do a laminectomy large enough to have the cord drift away. Uh, and even these larger ventral osteophytes can improve uh, with a posterior operation. I think your uh, I think your uh, case illustrates it in an excellent fashion. Thank you. 